So we are on tile three here. First spark run, Dark Souls the board game. I'm playing four characters solo. Rolling with the knight, the warrior. Got that duality, got that core going. Uh, the mercenary, just to try out. This is a character class that I've probably played the least. So I have two that I'm very familiar with. And then of course, I need some magic. We've got the sorcerer going. I've got some okay gear. I don't have the stats yet, but a, a decent start. And I'm rolling into the third tile here, a two soul encounter, one soul, one soul, two and two, facing the mini dancer. And I haven't drawn any chests yet. I have not faced any mimics. I'm, I'm a little bit surprised. And in the previous Dark Souls video that I posted up, we were exploring the idea of the mimic playing with them, but how in a fixed economy random game like Dark Souls, meaning I clear a tile, I get the souls, and we're talking about rules as written. No house rules, no homebrew rules. Not that there's anything wrong with doing that, but rules as written, I spend the souls to draw from the deck. And you get kind of what you get based on that. Some of that gear is going to be pretty useful right out. Some of it's going to take a little while with the stats. Um, I did draw some armor for the warrior, the class gear, and I leveled up the stats to be able to um, to wear it. So that was a, a nice little boost. But I'm going into the two soul encounters with the same basic weapons. Within that randomness, you're spending souls to level up your attributes and at the same time potentially blindly draw um, gear. Again, rules is written. This is why a, a chest is so important, one of the treasure chests, to be able to spawn those and at least get a free item. And on average, drawing from the spawn cards, I think you can count on one chest, maybe two if you're lucky, but at least one within a, a run. Well, I've only got one left before I move to the fog gate, then I'll be on the second spark and we'll make our way through. The positive side of this random draw is the fact that I have not encountered any traps yet. I've got my trap tokens over here ready to go, ready to deploy out. At the bottom of these cards, if there's a little uh, two-spear icon, that means you deploy traps, and that makes things uh, a little bit more interesting. So let's kind of pull back here for a second and talk about some tile tactics whether you want to utilize this in your game to make things a little bit easier, um, that could be helpful if you're looking to do a completionist run. What I mean by that is go through and do the mini boss, go through and do the main boss, and then at some point go through and do the mega boss. No reloads, no redo. If you get killed halfway through or towards the end, that is that. So I, I that's how I tend to play Dark Souls solo. And with that, a little bit of tweak, a little bit of customization, if it's within the rules, it is okay to do. Now, before we talk about the tiles and laying them out, some of the possibilities, the spawn points, I do want to mention, since we're talking about a completionist run, the characters that you select, whether it's going to be one, two, three, or four, without any spoilers, I don't like to tailor the characters I'm drawing to the bosses that you fight. Uh, these bosses, the mini bosses and the main bosses, they all have different attributes and they all have different ways of attacking. Often the figure will give you some ideas based on that, but they are some attack with elemental damage, some are immune to magic, some have magic resistance, some are vulnerable to magic. I don't want to pick a party that can potentially be crippled going against one of these bosses. I don't want to metagame it. Likewise, I don't want to pick a party that's going to be an easy run. And part of Dark Souls, of course, is the discovery of the game. Being able to go through, make a couple of runs, win, lose, learn. I'm pretty familiar with most of the bosses. So what I like to do is I like to pick the party of characters that I want to play. I go through, Fritz, what are you feeling? What are we going to do? What are we going to play? How are we going to do it? And then I randomly draw a boss. So sometimes it works out in my favor. Sometimes it doesn't work out on my favor, but it, it does keep it kind of interesting. So let's talk about tile deployment. We've got the bonfire here. 
and then we lay out four tiles that need to interconnect and then take us to the fog gate right here, which then goes into the mini boss or um, later the main boss. You randomly draw four tiles, you shuffle them up from the tile stack. And then with these four tiles, as you place them, you do have control over the orientation. Some have three entry points, three entry points. Um, some have only two entry points, two entry points. And of course the bonfire uh, has the two entry points ready to go in. So the question here is, tactically looking, how do you orient these tiles to give you a fighting chance? Um, likewise, based on the encounters of one soul, two souls, or three souls, or, or light, medium, and heavy, they get placed with the easiest souls closest, then the next two and the next two. So in the case of this, fighting the baby dancer, I've got easy, easy, hard, and hard. The hard encounters, remember in Dark Souls, the board game, uh, the monsters, the minions, the undead, they're going to activate first. And they spawn on these red nodes. And then you have barrels and chests and items spawn on the other nodes. In addition to the chests, you can spawn a barrel or a tombstone. Barrels, I'm going to be honest with you guys. Um, tactically, you can break them. They kind of open up some possibilities. But I very rarely find they come into play. Because, yes, maneuverability is key. And, and figuring out. Uh, the order of who's going to go what and what has range and just how much damage you can take, how much stamina. I mean, it is a tactical miniatures game, but it is also very, very much a puzzle-based game. So I find that while I'm figuring that out, um, the barrels, tactically, okay. It's, it's not like a major consideration. That said, when I have faced an invader uh, last game, one of the barrels literally saved me because it was able to slow down. An invader. The tombstones, um, they are important. They are very important because they're going to let you look at the deck when you build for the mini boss or the main boss and get an idea of some of the cards and the way they're coming. Uh, it sounds good in theory. My memory from just playing so many war games and so many editions of Warhammer 40,000 and Dungeons and Dragons, uh, after the first flip through, I'm like, I, I can't even remember what was there. But from the perspective of this run, I've got two tombstones deployed. That's that's okay. That's pretty good. And um, we'll see here if a chest plays out. But back to orientation with the two souls or the three souls or the light or the heavy souls, if you can rotate these tiles so the spawn points are further out because you're going to deploy on this edge here when you enter. Uh, likewise, Clearing this tile and clearing this tile. When I come to here, this gives me a choice of where to enter on which side. And I, I actually chose to enter off on this side. Because if I deployed here and here, spawn and spawn, uh, in theory I'd only get hit with this spawn. And we can see based on here, I've got two Silver Knight Swordsmen that spawned over here. That bought me one turn of them moving forward. So having that spawn point pushed off... Um, it's not going to help me from the ranged attacks, um, and I'll get hit by the hollow, but I'll take that and then I'll, I'll be able to kill him. It, it allows you to figure out very, very quick, do you want to be close or do you want to be far away? I tend to want to try and orient the harder encounters far away, and in theory some of the easier one-soul encounters, like here we went through the deeps, um, they can be a little bit closer. This orientation here is, is a great example. You've got a tile that has two spawn points on the far end. I can have this going right in from the spark and have this entire area ready to go. If I was able to draw this for a two soul or three soul or medium heavy encounter, meaning if this tile was over here, this would be excellent. I would rotate it this way and orient, put the orientation this way so these two are on the far end. That gives me a lot of room of maneuverability, or at least um, with the initial setup to be able to figure out where I want to go. So when you look, be ready to possibly rotate and 
reorient reorient some of these tiles and see what you can do. It's certainly within the rules. Um, likewise, you could just play hardcore mode where you randomly draw the tiles and you randomly place the tiles. And that's going to kind of really, really mess things up, um, especially if you get two rooms or two tiles, two areas back to back with the encounters spawning literally right where you deploy or having a two or, th or three soul encounter here, having that tile oriented. And now what that means is for every single run based on this, this current setup, I have to move through here, having it set up this way where I can go out to there and down or here and across depending on how many sparks I have left, depending on what this encounter would be, depending on where I am. In theory, if I'm getting hurt and hit really bad and I want to make that run for the fog gate, I could bypass this tile. I could decide, okay, I'm going to make the run for the mini boss. I'll go from the bonfire to here, to there, jump to there, and then into the gate. So it does offer um, a little bit of flexibility in planning things out. 